We've got some corn and cucumbers if you want them, and I brought some ha uh, jalapenos up here if you want them. So there's some miscellaneous vegetables laying around, in addition to some of us. But um, as far as announcements, we just have a couple. Howard Graff had some surgery this last week, and I guess he's getting. Uh, some more surgery, another surgery done coming up. I don't know when, but we want to keep Howard in our prayers. And I got a card here. Elaine handed me a card from uh, Darlene Tyler, and she wants to. She says that she appreciates all of us and she's thankful for us. She's blessed to have such an awesome church people who think of all the people who need them. That is God. I am blessed to come to a church of God and the church people who love. Thank you so much, signed Darlene. So she just wanted to thank you for reaching out to her and your prayers for her. Um, let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this new day you've given to us. And we're so grateful to be together with brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time. Father, at this time of uh, this pandemic, we pray that you'd be with each of us Help us to be wise in our approach to, to the daily things of life. Help us to uh, remain healthy. And uh, Father, we ask that you would protect us. Father, we ask that you'd be with the whole world, especially at this time, and help us to find some effective means to combat this disease. Father, as this country is looking for a change of leadership, for a new return, uh, continuing leadership, we just pray for um, those that are in power in the country, Father, we know that ultimately you've instituted the governments and uh, that we governments are not a fear for those who are, are following the law. Father, we thank you that there are laws that govern us. We ask that you would um, bless those men and women who are choosing to serve in Washington. Father, we thank you for uh, the blessings of life that you've given to us. We thank you for family, for friends, for the conveniences that you've given to us. Father, we ask that you would help us to remember that we are a light to the world, that through us, through our actions, someone may see Jesus and come to know that there is hope, that there is a future, and that they can have that peace that you offer, that peace that surpasses understanding. Father, help us to remember the great impact that we have throughout our neighborhoods, our, our work environments. And Father, we ask that you would just guide us, help us to be encouraging, help us to be kind and patient and all those things that, that you would have us to be. Father, we ask that you would accept our worship today. We know that you are the only true, the only wise God. Father, we know that creation is yours and everything in it. Uh, Father, we do praise you, and we ask now that you would be with us as we are worshiping. Help us to uh, keep in our hearts always that you are first and foremost in our lives. As through Jesus we pray, amen. Since it's not 100 degrees, let's all stand for the first song. Everybody looks pretty comfortable this morning. I know I am. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through me in courageous let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Is of God my Savior standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Be 
Ziel. The song before communion will be number 174. The Lord's Supper. Number 174, the Lord's Supper. When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought in closer union, while partaking of the bread. Precious feast, all else surpassing, gently whispers do this in my memory God so loved what wondrous measure loved and gave the best of him bought us with that matchless treasure yea for us was given precious feast all else surpassing wondrous love for you and me while we feast Christ gently whispers do this in my memory feast divine all Precious blood for you and me While we sup, Christ gently whispers Do this in my memory Precious feast, all else surpassing Wondrous love for you Gently whispers, do this in my memory. <coughs> so I thought the word we'd think about for communion this morning is the word reconciliation. So reconciliation is one of those churchy words that we kind of use at church a lot, but maybe not so much outside of church, except for when we're reconciling our checkbook or when you're a business owner and you got to reconcile the books. But I want us to talk about reconciliation. I was thinking about um, an example, and I was walking through my study, and I, I saw this uh, on my, de on my uh, shelf, The Man from Snowy River. Uh, it's a really good family movie. Joyce and I were talking about it recently because it has an actress in it that uh, popped up in a a series that we're kind of pandemic bin watching called Paradise, a Western series. But anyway, so I started thinking about the man from Snowy River, and uh, it's a side plot, so I won't give it away if, if you, uh, you want to watch the movie. But there are two brothers in this movie, and, and these brothers have a falling out. And that falling out leads to them being irreconciled to each other and sets in chain a series of events that just taints the whole movie and causes problems. In the very end, they're reconciled to some sort of other, uh, to some extent or other, uh, and everybody lives happily ever after. But it started me thinking about the difference between reconciliation between men and women, between people, and the reconciliation God has with us. It's very different. So I started thinking about the reconciliation between people that are at odds with each other. Uh, and I thought about four points. One is that people that are irreconciled don't necessarily really care if they're reconciled with the person that they have odds with because they don't like them. They're angry with them. They're mad at them. There's a problem. They're bad. The second thing, the characteristic with people that are at odds with each other is usually they only reconcile for a reason. Uh, there's a project that has to be accomplished, so we've got to reconcile to get this project done. 
uh, or we've got to reconcile so family events aren't toxic when people are at family events. A third characteristic of reconciliation between men uh, is that usually it involves both parties moving towards some you know, central agreement. Maybe one party moves a lot, maybe one party moves a little, maybe it's a 50-50 split, but usually both parties have to give something to make that reconciliation happen. And then the final point with reconciliation between people, usually it's not perfect reconciliation. Like, we're gonna to agree to get along, but you know, I'm, you're still not my favorite person. You know, I, you're still on my blacklist. Um, and then you think about the reconciliation that God gives us. God is irreconcilable with us because we are sinners, but God loves us and he wants to be reconciled with us. Uh, he loves us. To, you know, have you ever, ever been irreconciled with someone that you just really loved and wanted to have a relationship with? Um, probably not too often. So another reason that is different with God's reconciliation is that um, God doesn't have to have reconciliation with us. He doesn't need it. It's just something he wants. There's no ulterior motive to it. There's no purpose of his that accomplishes other than he wants to be reconciled with us. The third contrast is in men's reconciliation, both parties usually move. In God's re reconciliation, he does all the heavy lifting. He does it all. He comes to us. You know, we do nothing. He does it all. And then finally, men's reconciliation with each other is usually of sorts. It's usually not perfect, whereas God's reconciliation is perfect. Um, the chapter, the verse I want to read before we were taken to communion is uh, titled the, the Ministry of Reconciliation. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll read a few verses from there. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the minister, ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your son who came to earth to reconcile us to him, Father. We are irreconciled from you because of our sin, but through the body and blood of Christ, we can be made perfectly righteous even though we are sinful beings, Father. Thank you for this gift and help us to think about this as we partake of the communion, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's say thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, again, we approach your throne thinking about the blood which cleanses us from our sins, Father, and reconciles us to you, Father. We, we thank you that, that you love us enough to give the greatest thing you had to reconcile us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And then before we close out, let's let's say a prayer. Um, you know, we, we kind of do the offering, you know, on your own and dropping by or mailing in or dropping the box here. But but uh, I think it is time, uh, it is a good time for us to stop and thank God for all the material blessings he's given us that, that allow us to, to give back to the church. Father in heaven, we realize that our nation's really struggling, Father, in many ways, economically and other ways. But Father, help us remember how blessed we are, Father, and help us to continue to be generous so that the work of the church, which is so needed at this time, can go forward. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our song before the prayer will be number 17. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. Number 17. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. 
all his souls together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and skies. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day this beautiful morning that we have been given that shows your power and your awesomeness. Thank you for granting us this time that we can assemble here and worship you. We pray that as we worship, that our worship will be done in accordance to your will. We're thankful that we can meet outside like this in this time of trouble. We can meet outside like this like the early Christians did. We thank you for their example and the examples that we have through the Christians that have gone on before us. Thank you now again for this day, those who could attend here this morning, the opportunity that we have to partake of the communion, that we have an opportunity to pray, that we have an opportunity to sing, we have an opportunity to give, we have an opportunity to hear your message. We pray that as the message is delivered, that we will pay attention, we will open our ears and our hearts and take in your word. We also at this time pray for Howard, and his family, for the Ash family, as they need prayers for Winnie. We also pray for Barb and her family, and Sue Goodman and her family, who have asked an interest in these prayers. Thank you for the very life you have given us, the health that we enjoy, the fellowship that we enjoy in, in this congregation. Be with us now as we go through the remaining part of this day. And we pray that you'll be with each of us as we go about our daily lives, that we will strive our best to reflect you in, in the things that we do and the things that we say. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your sacrifice for us to purchase our redemption so we can have an eternal home with you one day in heaven. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The song after Mark's sermon will be number 593, Jesus the Loving Shepherd. And if you would, please stand with me as we sing number 519 when we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and 
and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Church, good morning. I want to thank all the guys who have uh, helped lead us this morning and really all through these many weeks that we've been meeting out here. Uh, all the fellows who have participated. And we've had several that have done things they've never done before. We appreciate that. And, and just the great job that everybody's done and all the help that we get setting up and tearing down there. Uh, we appreciate it. Your, your heart of service. I want to share with you a little piece as we begin, entitled, A Toddler's Rules of Possession. They're sort of a Ten Commandments for toddlers. You may have heard this before, maybe not. Number one, if I like it, it's mine. Two is, if it's in my hand, it's mine. Three, if I can take it from you, it's mine. Four, if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. Five, if it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. <laughs> Six, if I'm doing or building something, all pieces are mine. Seven, if it looks just like mine, it's mine. Eight, if I saw it first, it's mine. Nine, if you're playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. And number 10, if it's broken, it's yours. One of the first things that we have to teach our children as they emerge from infancy to toddler stages the concept of sharing, isn't it? And, you know, some things are mine and some things are not mine. It's a tough lesson to learn because up to that time, they have assumed that everything was theirs. And, you know, if you think about it, prisons are filled with people who, for whatever reason, never learned that lesson. And sometimes when you look at how people treat one another, you realize they've still got a lot to learn in this department. In a similar way, one of the things we have to learn in order to attain maturity in Christ is this concept of not mine, but his. So we're talking in a brief series of lessons from the Gospel of John about this idea. And we've emphasized so far, not my will, but his will. And also, not my teaching, but his teaching. Today, it's not my glory, but his glory. So we've, we've talked about this feast that was going on in Jerusalem, Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus visits the feast in John chapters 7 and 8. That's where uh, John tells about it. And the text for this morning keeps us in Jerusalem at the temple for this feast where Jesus is teaching, he's interacting with people, and actually having a lot of conflict with uh, the, those that are in the religious establishment who had set themselves up as his enemies. We pick up in verse 48 of John chapter 8 today. In the previous verse, verse 47, Jesus has just said to these people something that did not sit well with them at all. 
He said, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Now imagine saying that to a group of preachers and teachers and elders, saying to them, you are not of God. Again, uh, you know, anybody that thinks that Jesus was just this mealy-mouthed wimp who walked around on eggshells all the time, not wanting to offend anybody, really needs to read that verse and consider it. In fact, this whole section of John underlines the fact that Jesus was really not concerned about what the elites thought of him. He didn't really care if Rabbi Dr. So-and-so approved of his message. He didn't check in with old man Cranky Face to get the okay for his sermon. Jesus spoke truth. And he let the chips fall where they may. Especially when it came to those who were sort of the self-righteous religious hypocrites of the day. And Jesus embodied the attitude that I want to put before you today from this passage. Not my glory, but his glory. So we need to think a little bit about what this word glory means. In that, the language of the day, Greek, the word was doxa. And that's translated glory in the New Testament. And it meant to them something like having a good opinion of. When they use that word, that's sort of what they, they meant. Having a good opinion of someone, or having a good reputation, or, or being worthy of praise, that kind of thing is what they tended to think when, when they used the word glory. And I suppose that most of us would prefer it in general if people thought well of us. You know, parents often train their children, exhort them to, to be concerned about our good reputation, not to do anything that would detract from the family name, that kind of thing. And it just feels good, doesn't it, once in a while to get some praise for doing something well. But Jesus teaches us here that that, that can go too far. It can, it can actually become our goal in life to seek the praise of men, and that is a real problem. We can become people pleasers to a fault. Sometimes people will even be dishonest, lie, and, and, and cheat just to maintain a good reputation, or what they would think is a good reputation. Scripture says of Jesus in one place, so Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. You see, not my glory, but his glory. John later on in this gospel in the 12th chapter, he expounds on this idea even more. He, he talks about how even though Jesus did all these mir miracles, he performed these incredible signs and these works of power for many people to see, people still did not believe in him. Let me ask you today. If you, with your own eyes, saw Jesus do a miracle, would you believe? Would you? Are you sure? Because they didn't. And, and John says that their hearts were so hard to the truth that they wouldn't believe their own eyes. They saw it, but they wouldn't believe. And he, he even says that a lot of the religious authorities, these people who saw these things, they actually believed what they saw, they believed in him, but because they were afraid of the Pharisees, the very people they were most intent on impressing, you see, the very people they wanted the most approval from, 
Because of that, they wouldn't confess their belief. Let me ask you this morning. Did their belief in Jesus save them? Now, there's a lot of preachers, I imagine, across the county this morning telling people believing on Jesus alone will save them. But it didn't save those people because they were too afraid to confess it. Why were they so afraid? Because they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. That's, that's John chapter 12, verse 43. Go check that verse out. And it's true. It's as true today as it was then. I guess it could even be true in some hearts to, that, that are with us. You believe in Jesus, but you won't confess it. You won't take the next step. You won't repent. You won't be baptized into Christ. Why? Maybe because you, you'd rather be glorified by man than by God. Jesus says this way back in, in chapter 5 of John. He says, I do not receive glory from people. And then he says, how can you believe? When you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Not my glory, but his glory. Let's go back to the temple and the festival in John 8. Remember how, how Jesus started out this uh, interaction with them. He just said to them, in verse 47, you are not of God. So how do they respond? Let's notice it beginning in verse 48. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory, there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Now I want you to notice what they did there in verse 48. Don't miss what they did. Note that the, the N-word had not been invented yet, but the S-word had. And they use an ugly, hateful, racial slur to attack Jesus in verse 48. And then on top of that, they accuse him of being demon-possessed. I think it's true in... in every verse of every story about Jesus that they're incredible lessons for us to learn think of the one here how does Jesus respond to being called a bad name how does he respond he doesn't he doesn't he ignores it Notice, he doesn't call CNN. He doesn't create a meme on social media. He ignores it. Why? How? Because he is not about his glory, but about God's glory. They can call him all the names they want. They can think whatever they want to think about him. 
They can spit upon him. They can mock him, slap him. They can nail him to a tree and laugh at him. How does he respond? He does not. Like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. I wish that I could be like Jesus here. But I care too much about what people think about me. How about you? Jesus only responds to their accusation of of him being demon possessed because that reflects on his heavenly father. And, And Jesus never let people degrade the father. Jesus was all about the glory of God. So he would defend God, but not himself. Not my glory, but his glory, you see. So often today, people have that attitude backwards. They'll defend themselves, but never think of defending God. Jesus went all the way to the cross, not defending himself in order that he might glorify God and to save you and me. There is just so much here for us today. I want you to notice the, the way it closes in verse 54. The Lord says, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me. Here's true spiritual maturity. If we could just learn to live like this. Not my glory, but his glory. Not my will, but his will. Not my teaching, but his teaching. Not my glory, but his glory. Not mine, but his. When we can get to the point where we're more concerned about what God thinks of us than what others think of us, then we'll have achieved something and God will be able to achieve much more in us. Because in the end, all that will matter is God's opinion of us. On that great day that's coming, when we stand before our Creator, it won't matter what I think of you. It won't matter what the national media thinks of you, or what your boss thinks of you, or what the Twitterati think of you. All that will matter is God. And if you're right with God, Not my glory, but his glory. Let's pray. Father, what a glorious day you've given us. Thank you for your incredible blessing. Thank you for Jesus who teaches us and shows us the way and help us to live for him. We're assembled here to praise your name. We ask your blessings on each one that's here and all our, our individual needs. And, and we pray that we will learn to be most concerned about your view of us. Thank you for your love in Christ. We pray in him. Amen. Jesus, a loving shepherd, calleth thee now to come into the fold of safety where there is rest and room. Come in thy strength of manhood, come in the morn of youth. Enter the fold of safety, enter the way of truth. Lovingly, tenderly calling is he, 
Wonder, wonder, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see. Jesus, my shepherd divine. Lingering is but folly. Wolves are abroad today. Seeking the sheep who are straying. Seeking the lambs to slay. Jesus, the loving shepherd, calleth thee now to come. Enter the fold of safety, where there is rest and room. Lovingly, tenderly calling is he. Wonder, wonder, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see. Jesus, the shepherd divine. You bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we're just thankful for this time together. And Father, we pray that this time that we spend in worship sets a tone for our, our week. Father, we pray, like we've learned the last few weeks, that we'll have an attitude of, instead of my will be done, that we'll show other people that it's more important that thy will be done. And Father, we pray that instead of being a people where we follow our own teaching, our own opinions, that we'll follow thy teaching, and then we'll have a scripture-based uh, thinking. Father, we pray that, like we learned today, that instead of seeking our own glory or the praise of men, that we'll be a people that push the glory back to, to you, and that others will maybe even ask why we act the way we do, and Father, help us to be courageous to step through that door when it's, when it's open to us. Father, we're thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus, and because of that, we are reconciled. Father, we pray that, um, again, we'll be ready to tell others that message of the reason that we act differently is because of that reconciliation. Father, just like the song we sang earlier, we pray that we'll always keep in mind that when we get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, that what a day of rejoicing that will be, that we will sing and shout the victory. Father, help us be a people with that attitude as we go out this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.